Hello, we're here with Judge Melinda Young, who is running for re-election to King County Superior Court position six. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? All right, thank you very much. So I am running for position six for King County Superior Court. I was appointed by Governor Inslee in 2018. Uh, a little bit about me is I grew up in South King County in Maple Valley. I went to undergraduate at Washington State University. I went to law school at University of Washington. And then after that, I became a trial attorney for 23 years before being appointed to the bench. I was a trial attorney with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, where I'd say the first half of my career, I did jury trials, lots and lots of jury trials which really helped with the transition to the bench. I'm very comfortable in the courtroom. I primarily worked with vulnerable victims, so with domestic violence victims and sexual assault victims. Um, in the last half of my time at the King County Prosecutor's Office, I was promoted into leadership. I helped create the first mental health court for uh, Washington State, and it was the second in the nation. I oversaw the domestic violence unit down in Kent, where we worked to take firearms away from abusers. I oversaw the white collar fraud unit, and in particular, the elder abuse group that was part of that unit that is nationally recognized. And we created a multidisciplinary team that worked with doctors doctors and adult protective services and nonprofits to help senior citizens who are being either neglected or um, financially exploited. And then I was appointed to the bench after that. Um, I've been rated exceptionally well qualified by all of the bar associations that have interviewed me. And I currently have no opponent. I have no reason to think anybody will file against me next week, but I am still hoping that I can earn the 36th uh, legislative district uh, um, endorsement. Great, thank you. Um, so now we'll move on into our four prepared questions that we're asking all superior, uh, superior court candidates. Um, and I am going to go in the order of Sherry, Alice, Jeff, and then Jason. Um, okay. And I'll go ahead and post those in the chat box. So uh, Sherry, would you like to go ahead with question one? Uh, the responses are two minutes apiece for these. Hi, um, the first question is, what are the pros and cons of going to the bench as compared to practicing law? So, you know, it's, I've been in the courtroom for almost 25 years now, and those things are the same as far as that goes. Being in the courtroom is what I love. I think there's a lot of um, reality to the courtroom as it applies to the people of our community. But it's, um, it's very different being on the bench more so than I would have expected. It is easier when you have a side, essentially. You have a position to advocate and then you let somebody else make the decision. So it's a more challenging role when you feel that you are the one who has to decide what happens. Um, and it's, so I, I practiced criminal law for virtually all of my career prior to being on the bench. But on the bench, I've been assigned to doing civil law. King County, I'm in Washington State, is a general jurisdiction. So we move around um, doing all kinds of different things. And I thought initially that civil law might be easier in some ways but I found that it is every bit as difficult to try and make those kinds of decisions. So, um, you know, as far as pro and con, there's lots of things that are the same and that what you do matters and listening to people matters. But um, I would say it's a lot tougher when you don't have a side that's sort of predetermined for you in a position to argue. Great, thank you. Uh, Alice, would you uh, go ahead with question two? Sure. Um, what have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiency, and what other methods would you suggest? So I think what we have to do is always realize that there are, right now in King County, there are so many new judges, as you maybe already know with that, that there has been about a 50% turnover in the last three or four years. And when people are new, they tend to move slower. Um, it, it's just sort of the way it goes. So right now there is a tremendous backlog of civil cases. And with the pandemic going on, we're not doing jury trials at all. We stopped doing jury trials mid-March and they've been all put off until the beginning of July. And so I think what we have to do is try and figure out how to be efficient with doing jury trials once we start up again to get through them. Because if we don't 
do these trials, then people do not have access to justice. They don't get their cases heard, whether it's civil or criminal. And so having experience, I think is gonna really matter, whether or not it's judicial experience or trial experience, having trial lawyers who are there um, to be able to get through that. And we need to be able to figure out other ways to try and be more efficient with the time that we have in court. We tend to have a lot of breaks, which we need to have, but we need to figure out a way to, to work through. And, and that particular question, I think, is going to be um, incredibly important right now as we have sort of this unprecedented backlog of jury trials that we're going to have to try and, and figure out. Um, there are priorities with how to do that. Um, criminal trials have the first priority. Seconds. Uh, but we need to be able to figure out other ways to get through to the cases that are lower down, which are the civil cases, um, to make sure that people can have um, the issues that are important to them um, heard. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, uh, would you take question three, please? Sure. As a judge, what would you consider your greatest strengths and weaknesses? So. I think my greatest strength is that I do have a lot of trial experience. I am a relatively new judge. I've been on the bench for a little over a year and a half now, um, but I have a lot of trial and so I'm really comfortable doing the trial parts of it. Where I'm weaker at clearly is that my background is criminal law and I've been doing civil law for the past uh, you know, year and a half. And so while I'm getting more comfortable with that, um, I still sometimes have to do family law, I've done dependency trials, and sort of having this incredible range of things in which you're supposed to make the decision is, um, it's daunting. Um, and it, it does tend to make us slower, potentially, and less efficient with what we're doing. But on the other hand, it really is um, important to be able to, to do all those. And I try to make sure that I can listen to what the attorneys are telling me or what the parties are telling me because they're often the subject matter expert in the law that I'm hearing or certainly in the case that I'm hearing with it. So I think my strength is understanding how to navigate those difficult issues with it and doing the trials, which is primarily what a King County Superior Court judge does. And my weakness is, is I just don't have as much experience as some other people in some of these areas of law where I'm expected um, to be the expert. Great, thank you. Uh, question four, uh, Jason, would you take that one? Yes, uh, question four, describe your most difficult case. Why was it difficult and how did you handle it? And so are you asking about a difficult case that I did as an attorney or a difficult case that I did as a judge or does it really matter? Uh, I think uh, something you can pick out that you are uh, not violating any kind of ethical thing. Okay. You, as a judge? As it can be throughout your legal career. Yeah. Okay. So for me, the most difficult case that I did was when I was a prosecutor and I was prosecuting sexual assault cases. Um, there was one case where um, the defendant was a, known to be a serial rapist. He was suspected of being a serial killer. And the entire case came down to the word of one woman. Um, and it was a long trial and it was a really difficult trial. And it was really hard. It, I think when it comes to sexual assault cases, victims do not always behave in ways in which uh, people expect them to behave. And this was the early 90s too. So, uh, or I should say mid 90s. Um, so it was a, a time where that was really very difficult um, to do that. And I, I was doing it by myself and I, I really realized, felt the weight of what would happen if the jury did not believe this woman because of this person's background. He had raped 10 different women that I knew of and that we presented. Um, ultimately, only, only the one woman testified to the jury, but there were nine other women who I had interviewed and um, and then there were three other people with whom he was suspected to have killed and been investigated for. And so that was just the most difficult trial for me to do. Um, as a judge, I oversaw, so I have been assigned to civil, but I did oversee a case, there was seconds. a homicide case where the, um, one of the defendants was 15 years old when he committed the homicide. And a, another judge had decided that 
he was going to be tried as an adult. So feeling the weight of that case and then feeling the weight of deciding the sentencing for someone who was 15 years old when he committed a crime was um, very, very daunting to figure that out. Great, thank you. Um, so now we'll move into the uh, follow-up questions and the responses to those are one minute apiece. And I'll go ahead and ask the group uh, to raise your hand um, using the button or message me in the chat if you'd like to ask a question. And sometimes it takes a little bit because there has to be a different way. Um, I saw that Clayton and uh, Liz are on. If you're using your phones uh, to unmute yourself, it is star six, I believe. All right, Jeff. Uh, yeah, so um, as you know, uh, Your Honor, the uh, court system and legal system overall are um, vastly underfunded in this state, like many states. So I'm wondering, how have you used your role on, on the bench or as an, as an appointed judge, and how will you, uh, as an elected judge, advocate for fully funding our legal system? You know, that's a really good point, because Washington state courts are the, one of the most underfunded in the nation. Um, there are such a variety of ways in which we need to be able to have, ensure our jurors are able to be fully paid. Right now, I think one of the big problems is that we have very uh, low diversity in our jury pool because of the way in which we bring them in. Um, I think, you know, educating and lobbying within the constraints of the ethics that we have is really important. 30 seconds. Um, I think the judicial branch tends to be a little inscrutable and unknown in many ways to the public. And so trying to make that better known by different advocacy programs within schools, not just law schools, but colleges and um, you know, K through 12 as well, to just Ten emphasize seconds. how important it is that what we do is fully funded and make sure that it is access to justice for all. Thank you. Any further questions? Jason, yes, go ahead. Um, where is our justice system is heading 10, 15, 20 years uh, down the road? What we kind of know about people and, and, and justice and all this brings to us in our society. Well, I think there's two different things that are going on. One is with the criminal justice system. I think there is a long overdue recognition of over-incarceration and racial disproportionality. And so I think we are taking steps to address those issues. We certainly can go further. I mean, all of us can go further in trying to do better with those particular issues in particular alternatives to incarceration. And I think King County in a lot of ways has led the way. Um, what seconds. I worry about when it comes to civil law is that people who have money um, not only tend to be better represented, but they may funnel things into to private systems. So as the civil system gets overloaded and cases can't get heard, people who have money can kind of do this end run and do their own private system where people who don't have to sit Ten and seconds. wait to be heard, you know, months or years down the line, depending on how this pandemic shakes out. And that's something I think we really need to take a hard look at. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I have one. Um, how do you uh, handle or how do you deal with pro se uh, litigants in your court? You know, it's, it's always the trickiest thing, I think, because pro se's are supposed to be held to the same standards as attorneys. They're held to the same rules of evidence. They're same, held to the same court rules. And yet, you can't do that exactly. And I know that I don't do that exactly. I try to make sure that anybody who is in my courtroom, whether they're pro se or an attorney, is dealt with with respect and are heard fully. I really try to make sure that I explain to them as best I can without violating my ethics. 
on what it is that they need to do. I try to make sure to let them know of the resources they have of the King County Law Library and the librarians there that are tremendously helpful. I point them to the court rules. I point them to the King County local court rules. And then I just try to give them as much latitude as I can. Ten I have had a pro se plaintiff civil jury trial and things ended up going pretty well. It's mostly just going down to respect and making sure that you understand where they're coming from and you respect what they're saying. Great, thank you. Uh, Liz Campbell. Hi, so my question actually um, is more about uh, you and how you handle you given all of the situation, right? So you're underfunded and there's a, a constantly emotionally charged, very difficult cases um, that you're hearing over and over again. And I'm really wondering at the end of the day, how do you take care of you so that you're healthy and happy and stable to go back into the courtroom again tomorrow? You know, it's a really good question. Um, I know that lawyers in general have some of the highest substance abuse issues um, going on. And so I do think it's, it's really important to make sure that you have outlets. Uh, being a judge has been really different than practicing because I can't talk about what I do um, to so many people anymore. I used to have such a great group of friends that I could talk to about some of the difficult issues, and that just doesn't exist anymore. I am really lucky because I have spent seconds. my entire career in the courtroom that I do know many of the other judges. I consider them friends, and that's who I talk to. Um, there's also court staff. I have a bailiff who um, I met as part of this job when I hired her, but her and I talk a lot. Um, and I have, you know, my husband and my two sons here Ten that seconds. I try to talk to as well, just to decompress and um, and do the best I can with with taking it seriously, but also understanding it's my job. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Uh, are there any other questions? Make sure I'm not missing any. I have another one. I always like to ask this one. Uh, what are your major influences? Um, so I would say my mom, it's cliche as that is. Uh, you know, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s and my mom was an early uh, feminist at that time. And um, she was a stay at home mom though. And so she always had this sort of tug back and forth between um, staying at home and then being really frustrated with staying at home. Um, and then I suppose the other one is a woman by the name of Becky Rowe, who started the sexual assault unit at the King County Prosecutor's Office. She's why I went where I went seconds. when I got out of law school. Um, she really championed uh, believing women. Um, she really championed um, sexual assault survivors and letting them tell their story and recognizing that no two people act the same way and that if someone's a prostitute, they can still be a victim. I um, mean, I really admired her and I, I've seconds. gotten to know her now. Um, and I think she's just tremendous, just a tremendous lawyer and human being. Thank you. Um, I see that Jason has his hand up. Would you like to go ahead, Jason? Uh, yes. Uh, what's your uh, judicial uh, philosophy in, in your work? Well, so as a trial judge, it's a little bit different than most of the appellate judges way to describe it. You know, I would say that to me, the most important thing is to listen more than, than I talk in the courtroom. So when people are making arguments, I try to make sure to listen. And then in particular, when it comes to trials, I want to be sure that I let the lawyers or the pro se parties in my courtroom try their case. They need to be able to present their story in the best way that they can. And they try and make sure seconds. that they can be heard in telling their story, either to the jury or to me, if I'm the one who's making the decision. So I don't review appellate cases. I, I, you know, that really isn't part of my job. My job really is just in listening to the stories and helping other people tell their stories within boundaries of professionalism Ten seconds. and respect. And so I would say that that's really my overarching philosophy is letting others do their job within the best way that they can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are very close to time. Would you like to go ahead and give a one minute wrap up? Sure, absolutely. 
So I, I do hope that I can earn your endorsement. I have dedicated my career to public service, and in particular, I've dedicated my career to some of the really marginalized people in our community, uh, the mentally ill, the domestic violence, the sexual assault victims, the elder, elderly um, who are abused. I do bring a depth and a breadth of experience to the court, and I am hoping for the opportunity to serve for four more years. So thank you very much. I appreciate all of your time. Um, I know that this is a deep time commitment for all of you, and so I thank you for doing this. Thank you, Judge Young.